Good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to uh, CE 3372, Water Systems Design. Uh, you knew that that's what you're here for anyway, and uh, I'll try to keep an eye on any additional people that are joining, and I th think I'm sharing just my web browser window. So that's, I uh, hope that actually works out better. Um, okay, participants, commit, grab that, put it over there. But I'm recording my entire screen, I think. And uh, this morning, during the recording, uh, my computer messed up and so I lost quite a bit of it. It could happen to today on this one too, but we'll we'll see what happens. Um, and so to uh, get started, uh, I have on the window the blackboard, and we will go to lesson two in the lesson collection. And choose lesson two. This will link us to uh, the content server, and with any luck, Lesson 2 examines design manuals as tools to guide hydraulic design and drinking water systems. Manuals are examined uh, in the context of drinking water design. So we're going to um, look at some selected uh, manuals. So there's quite a bit, quite a lot of links here. And these are manuals that I uh, selected uh, off the internet. Um, and they, they represent varying degrees of elaborateness, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, some of them are quite long. For example, the Infrastructure Design Manual in Houston, around 400 pages. San Marcos Design Manual for Water Distribution System is 35. Uh, I think it's 35 pages, we'll know in a second, 16 pages, 15 if you take that page away, 14 when you take the blank page away, and 13 when you get rid of the table of contents. So this one's quite a bit more compact. Uh, that reflects both the different size of the uh, two communities as well as the actual scope of the manual because the Houston one is for all infrastructure and this is specifically for waterline uh, desirement. De uh, design. Oh, I think we'll come back and visit this in a little bit. And then the video links, um, yeah, I don't think any of those are active right now. They're not. Uh, the contour plots and how to use a simple contour map, um, those are active videos. And later on in this evening lesson, I will demonstrate uh, uploading data and contouring it um, for a particular example, and the uploading keys are, are right here in the uh, in the link. The user ID is ID10T, and the password is TTU student. And I believe I may have demonstrated that last time also, but we'll do it again. So let's begin. So. Um, the first uh, set of design guidelines, part one, uh, begins now. And in that, uh, just some discussion on the um, general principles of uh, water distribution design. Um, quickly a step back or a step away in the concept of design overall. Um, this is a paraphrase from a design society in the United States that's more aimed at product design, but um, I think it's got a lot of uh, parallels in engineering design. And, and what this particular document uh, says is that design is simply the management of constraints. Okay, a single sentence and then we're done. We know all there is to know about design. Um, uh, if that were the case, things would be a little easier. There's two categories of uh, 
what are called constraints. Uh, one of those categories are the non-negotiable. There's not much you can do about them. So the laws of physics, at least on this planet, we're kind of stuck with them. Uh, chemistry as we know it, we're kind of stuck with that. And getting water to flow uphill spontaneously is impossible. Now we can take money and throw it at the water and get water to flow uphill. Uh, but the non-negotiable constraint is the uh, law of physics that requires us to provide enough energy to that water to make it go uphill. Uh, chemical disinfection, residual deplaying over time is another example. And um, what that particular chemical principle does is it encourages the use of treated water relatively quickly. So we can't really negotiate those things. Uh, but there are a selection of design variables and features that we can adjust, and we use those to satisfy the non-negotiable requirements, the desired system performance, and ultimately to uh, design and build uh, the product for society. The main components of negotiable are money, time, aesthetics, and overall system performance. And then each of those are obviously sub sub subdivides um, within uh, their broader contexts. The water system designer's goal is to satisfy a need at some level of performance by, by manipulating negotiable constraints. So we could satisfy the physiological need for water by putting it in a truck and driving it um, to intersections in different parts of a community and putting out a public service announcement saying the water truck will be in your neighborhood at 3 this afternoon. Um, that's not a very desirable level of performance um, compared to what we've become used to or what we can reasonably expect in modern society. Um, so the level of performance uh, we've created in our communities is pretty much on-demand supply of up to 30 gallons a minute for a while. Um, that might be the level of performance that we're after, and then that becomes something that we um, can change pipe sizes and orientation to try to make that happen. Uh, we apply analytical t tools in in um, in this process, uh, in particular for uh, this uh, discipline, hydraulic models, and we use that to test our design before we commit to actually building it. Um, now these, these tests in the computers are approximations of whatever real network we're going to build, but those approximations pro provide us the ability to evaluate whether our design is going to be terrible or adequate. That's about the best you can get out of a model. The model can't tell you if something's going to be great, but it can tell you if something will be terrible which is useful. Um, and the reason we do that is building out what we draw without um, doing some kind of analysis is a full scale experiment. And if it works, great, then we save some time and money. But if it fails, uh, we've got to work on our resume and move to a nation that does not have an extradition treaty with the United States. So it's easier just to do a model and check it that way. Uh, Design guidelines that we follow are encapsulated in various regulatory documents. So those are rules we have to follow. Design manuals, like I just showed you an example of. Um, professional literature, manufacturer's literature, and even um, the academic literature. And all these documents and references represent pretty much centuries of observation, uh, experience, and experimentation, and most likely a whole lot of failures along the way. And so the value of these um, is that following the guidelines, uh, whatever design we come up with will, will probably work. And it reduces some certain commercial risk for routine water system components. Um, and it still doesn't inhibit creativity. Uh, 
because there are some uh, creative uh, things that you'll certainly encounter in your careers to uh, do these designs and make them uh, fiscally efficient as well as performing their hydraulic and community tasks. So the four basic elements of a distribution system design are how much water will be used. That's uh, the, the, the demand calculation. We'll spend an entire lesson on that. I believe it's the next one, actually. Where's the water, raw water supply located? Where are the water consumption locations? So items two and three pretty much help dictate um, the assuming it's going in pipes, the pipeline network to bring water from the water source to a treatment plant and then from a treatment plant to the uh, end use customers. And item four is how does that water get used over time? So do all of our customers demand that 35 gallons a minute uh, out of their uh, tap at the same moment in time? Um, we could design for that. That would produce a system of pretty large capacity that may not ever get used. On the other hand, if we only expect one or two customers at a time to turn things on, we may undersize a system. So there's a huge balancing act, and there's no, no straightforward single uh, equation, if you will, that'll help you, uh, that, that, will, that will answer that question. Uh, there's a certain amount of design art involved. Uh, big enough to have the capacity we need when everyone uses it, small enough that we can afford to build it. That's really what it comes down to. <clears throat> when we're looking at new systems, brand new, so we're building a new, a new, um, a new city in the middle of nowhere. Um, and we know the city's going to have a few hundred thousand people and we want to lay it out ahead of time. You know, that, that probably doesn't happen all that much anymore, but it could. Uh, in those instances, calculating the required demands is not straightforward. Uh, we have to know what the expected demands are, what the fire demands are going to be, and what future expansion is going to be. And so if it's a brand new system that's not a build out of an existing system, there's a fair amount of guesswork involved in this step. Uh, there are publications that provide estimates of average demands for residential, commercial, and uh, industrial facilities, um, and some of them we will examine when we do the demand lecture. Uh, if someone were able to find or build a modern database of such information, that would be a really good data science project uh, for the future. It may have already been done, but it's not something I'm aware of, and I certainly looked for it. I've looked for that recently. Um, that would be a handy tool to have around. But in the meantime, we would refer to various publications. And some of the ones that are on the uh, server here for the class have tables uh, aimed exactly at this particular um, topic. The different demands that have to be accounted for are the, um, the customer's ordinary demand, average use needs that, that's needed for non-emergency needs. We also have to consider the required fire flow demand. So the, the system has to have enough capacity to provide water for fire protection or fire suppression while maintaining minimum pressure in the system. And um, um, that just disrupted my brain. Fire, f fire flow Fire flows can be quite large, um, and we would have to design a system to be able to provide that, but a fire flow is something you don't have to provide very often. So, uh, you know, in, in principle, you're building capacity that may never get used. Uh, in large, um, large cities, metropolitan areas, um, on the top of tall buildings, they actually have tanks on the top that are... Uh, they get filled with water over time, and their purpose is simply to provide water for the sprinkler systems in the building. Um, so that if those sprinkler systems deploy, it's using gravity drainage, and um, there are certain prescriptions on how how much pressure that has to produce for how long. Uh, so maybe it's supposed to provide 20 minutes of water at 
40 psi to the sprinklers. Um, alternatively, uh, where that's not feasible, like in a residential neighborhood, we, uh, we bring water to a fire hydrant. And there has to be enough uh, flow to provide the necessary fire suppression. Um, many of those guidance documents that I, I showed you a few seconds ago have explicit statements of fire flow requirements. They've made it easy for us as designers to handle item two. And item three is somewhat guesswork, but we have to know what the ultimate expansion of the system is going to be. And there's some things we can you know, do ahead of time or, or logical um, um, statements. I mean, a, a city cannot easily expand across a river, so you can consider a river to be a uh, physical boundary to expansion. Uh, same thing with uh, certain kinds of mountain ranges and and um, other uh, geomorphic features. And so that, that helps decide what the uh, total size of the system could possibly be. A water distribution system conveys water from a source to a customer. And the kinds of things that are sources are groundwater, uh, which could be a series of wells usually requiring treatment, um, at least uh, some kind of disinfection. Surface water that is already there anyway, so things like lakes and rivers, uh, the water is drawn in by intakes that are arranged to be just below the water surface. Uh, ocean, ocean desalination plant and coastal regions uh, would fall into this category. And then a different kind of surface water, which would be um, uh, municipal reservoirs that are designed to collect rainfall and snow melt, store it so they can be treated and provided to customers. So I grew up in, um, on the west coast in a county where all of our drinking water was from this third item. There were reservoirs up in the hills around the uh, various small cities there. And uh, the rainy season was relatively predictable and they could store a couple years worth of water in those reservoirs. So most of the time it was it was just fine. Drought years, usually the second year of a drought was a huge concern because um, we would draw uh, the water from the reservoirs. There was no alternative supply. To the west was the Pacific Ocean. To the east was the northern part of the uh, San Francisco Delta Bay system. Both of those are uh, saltwater, brackish water. And there was nothing that could be brought down from the north because there were no pipelines in place. So uh, if it was long enough drought, that was bad. Um, so that's, that's what's meant by that third category, the precipitation category. We move water from one place to another through uh, transmission lines. And then once we get close to where we want it to be, we have smaller distribution uh, mains. So the transmission mains um, are conduits that carry large volumes of water, and usually over great distances, uh, such as between a treatment plant and local storage facilities, or between a water, raw water source and a treatment plant. An example from around here would be the pipeline from Lake Allen Henry to the southeast treatment plant in Lubbock. I, I think it's on the order of 40 or 50 miles long, and it's pretty big diameter. I'm pretty sure I could drive my truck through it. Um, and there's another similar pipeline that comes from Lake Meredith down, um, down the highway from Amarillo into uh, the northern part of Lubbock. And, you know, that's getting up in the 70 or 80 mile distance. It's also a large diameter pipe. So those are what are meant by transmission lines in this uh, bullet item. The distribution lines are the smaller pipes and including the valves, hydrants, fittings, and various other appurtenances that deliver the treated potable water to the customers. So one way to picture it is transmission brings raw water to a treatment plant and possibly from that treatment plant to a large local storage facility. And then distribution takes from that storage facility uh, the treated water and delivers it to the end users. And all that um, leads to uh, 
just a handful of system uh, morphologies. And so these are the two basic configurations for water distribution system. Um, this particular figure is taken from a National Academy of Sciences document whose title I can't remember, and I'm not sure if I have it linked on the server or not. But the uh, picture on the left is called a branch configuration. And, you know, and it gets that name from its obvious appearance. It kind of looks like a tree, a very strange tree. Um, and the water supply is at this location here at the leftmost um, trunk. And as uh, points in the system require water, it has to traverse this main line and go that way and that way and then that way and that way and, and so forth. So if this user here is where the demand point is, the path, whatever water takes, is that path. Um, it's a branch. But if we look on this other, this loop or this grid system, um, a user's probably right about here. In a loop system, the, uh, the main line is still a main line, but the water can get to that point by that path, or by that path, or by this path. So it has multiple ways of getting there. And so that multiple way of getting there has some certain advantages um, in a uh, looped configuration. So if you had all the money in the world, um, you would probably design your systems uh, strictly looped. But if um, money is scarce, like it is for most of the world, uh, we would tend to prefer a branch configuration, although most real systems are hybrids of the two. So the advantages of a loop system, why they're attractive, is generally the flow velocities are lower. That reduces the head loss, because if you recall from your fluids class, uh, the head loss is proportional to the square of velocity. And that, that gives any specific part of the system overall greater capacity. Main brakes can be isolated. So for instance, if this main right here fails, uh, it can be valved off at either end. You can still get water to almost all the system. But if the equivalent location in this one uh, fails, the entire system is uh, taken out of service. I think I've just made a good argument for fiber optic networks to be looped. Huh. Uh, the other uh, advantage of a loop system is the uh, uh, fire suppression is greater capacity because the overall system has bigger capacity. Um, all those looped lines can be thought of as kind of inline storage. And then the last main advantage is loop systems provide a better residual disinfection capability because of inline mixing and because of fewer dead ends. So in the branch system here, each of these endpoints can be considered a dead end. If there's no flow demand at some instant, all the water in that section sits idle. And as you recall from your environmental engineering class, the uh, disinfection decay process goes on continuously. And so the ability of that water to remain uh, physiologically safe degrades over time. And after a week or two, there's no disinfection residual so that any um, incursion into the system of a, a pathogen or a contaminant you know makes all that water yucky. Technical term but yucky it is. Whereas in a loop system as long as there's at least some demand uh, at any point in here water is always moving through the system albeit quite slowly but it never stagnates. And fortunately, this is human-built stuff, so there's always leaks. So there's always water moving through a loop system. Disadvantage is pretty much just economic. Loop systems cost, cost more because there's pipes that are inadvertently or intentionally redundant to create the loops. Branch system has features also. Its advantages 
our our uh, economic economics um, they usually cost quite a bit less and avoids the construction of pipes and appurtenances just for the purpose of looping. In smaller rural communities, branch systems may in fact be the only type that's uh, logistically and monetarily feasible. Uh, the main disadvantages are main breaks uh, take all downstream customers of, of the break out of service. Uh, they have poor disinfection residuals in areas of low demand because uh, the water stagnates and um, there may have to be a periodic um, maintenance process flushing of hydrants to pull chlorinated water back into the system. When it does flow, velocities tend to be faster, so head losses are greater, and that reduces overall capacity during high demand. And the fire protection has the potential to be inadequate if there's a break in the system at the same time a fire occurs. So the uh, way we guide our design is using guidance documents. Um, there's regulatory documents as well as design manuals. So we'll talk about the regulatory first. Um, they're a principal tool in system design along with the designer's individual creativity and the owners, the person who we're designing the system for, their access to right away. Um, so regulatory implies rules and the Environmental Protection Agency writes federal rules for construction, maintenance, treatment, and operation of potable water facilities. There's a population lower limit on, on, on EPA's authority and I, I can't remember what it is. Um, it may be uh, 10,000 connections or 100,000. 10,000 sounds right. So if it's smaller than a 10,000 connection system, uh, the EPA um, has no statutory authority over it. Um, state environmental protection agencies or Department of Environmental Qualities or, or whatever their equivalents are called, they're charged with regulating the standards and the permitting. And most states in the U.S. are designee states, which, which means that the state EPA performs the role of the federal EPA on behalf of the federal government. And so most of, uh, most of the work is uh, following state rules because they're designee states. Now state can choose to write more stringent regulations if they don't violate the intent of the federal code. Um, and, uh, and some states do, California being a notable example of um, writing more stringent, stringent regulations and all sorts of things. Washington State also. Um, and in the, water, um, in the water world, uh, most of the state's rules are, are quite similar. Um, the American Water Works Association, which is a, think of it as a trade representation for the drinking water industry, um, they've been around a long time. They kind of created standards and manuals of practice that were ultimately adopted by individual states. So the nice thing about most drinking water is most of the rules regarding uh, its uh, safe distribution and treatment are fairly standard throughout the U.S. That's kind of a cool thing. These individual documents themselves, uh, this, is, this is my wording, they're, they're precise but in many cases quite tedious. Uh, I think they accomplish in 90 pages what any one of us individually could accomplish in one or two tables in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, but that's, that's just the way they are. Probably because attorneys are involved in the writing. Um, so one example uh, that's applicable for Texas is something called RG195. It represents a state level, it's representative of a typical state level document. And it's called Rules and Regulations for Public Water Systems. And, and what it is, we'll go look at it in a second. It says revised June 2012. Uh, so it's relatively recent. And what, what happened is, here's what I think happened, is that 
the TCEQ got a summer intern that couldn't figure out what to have them do, but they said, well, why don't you just compile all the, uh, all the rules from the Texas Administrative Code that apply to public drinking water systems? And this is the document that came out of something like that. Um, so it's kind of cool because somebody's summer internship created a document that's valuable for all of us. See if I can go back and not regret this. So I want to go look at RG195. I have it here at the top. And here's what the document looks like. And it, uh, it says what's the point, so forth, definitions, acronyms, and then it goes through the various rules. Subchapter D of um, Oh, Texas Administrative Code, I don't know if it's chapter 29 or 30 or 31, section 290.38 and so on. The, the, the um, classification system of, of the Texas Administrative Code is kind of weird. In fact, that symbol right there, which means section, uh, is hard to find on a computer keyboard. And then it has uh, a set of appendices associated with it. So let's go look at water distribution just for the heck of it. So here we are in Texas. All potable water distribution systems shall be constructed with American Water Works Association. So the National Trade Association is the um, cited authority for use in Texas. And then um, Various products have to conform to ANSI or National Sanitation Foundation Behavior Standard 61. And so these seemingly precise rules are, they're, they're not being original, they're referencing the designer to uh, industry standard um, collections of documents. And for instance, uh, this particular one gives us a uh, pressure rating for polymer-based pipes, and then it goes on and on. Uh, it has a useful design table that uh, helps us choose at least initial pipe sizes. So if we're going to serve 250 connections or greater, then we're going to want the smallest pipe we're going to use our 8-inch diameter. And so as our distribution system goes to smaller and smaller service areas, the uh, minimum size is specified. So I know that the pipe from the water meter to my house here in Lubbock, it's a, it's a two inch diameter pipe. I don't know that because of the table. I know that because I've, I've dug it up. I've dug, dug at it um, for other reasons. It had nothing to do with doing the plumbing. Um, then, uh, like most of them, there's a minimum pressure requirement. You notice that it's appearing quite early in the publication. Uh, in the case of the Texas one, it says it shall maintain a pressure of 35 PSI at flow rates of least 1.5 gallons per minute per connection. And if the system is going to provide firefighting capability, it must also be capable of maintaining a pressure of 20 PSI under fire and drinking water flow conditions. And by flow conditions, they mean design conditions. And then so on. And um, you'll, you'll have a chance to visit this during various exercises. <clears throat> Whoops. OK. I'm in the right lesson. Yep. Um, there's some other uh, manuals we could look at. I already looked at the city of San Marcos. Um, in fact, I want to revisit that one. Uh, that one is um, rep a, a good representation of a uh, simple manual for a smaller community. But I want to take your attention to the uh, early part of the report. So the first part of the report is telling you how to obtain permits. Um, 
what type of project it is, and then how how complaint how plans have to be um, submitted. And it normally has most of these will tell you actually how to do the drawings. I'm not sure if San Marcos does. I bet it doesn't, because we would see them already. Um, it gives you a way of uh, what they call uh, various distance measurements. It shows you valve spacing. It has fire hydrant spacing. Um, how to abandon a facility. So if you're going to uh, walk away from it, I mean when it when it's when it's past its service life, that's what they mean by abandonment. And so this is a good document in that it has bits and pieces of everything that uh, most major documents uh, contain. And that was just um, uh, one example. Uh, so there's other examples here, and they and they vary in complexity, scope, and uh, detail. Uh, a favorite one is the uh, Washington State Design Manual. It's a uh, relatively long thing because it. Uh, it it talks about um, almost everything you need. Uh, we got a couple of representative ones from California, and I'll just look at the uh, Sanitary Commission for uh, Washington. It has a pipeline design manual, and This one uh, tells how to design a pipeline, or at least to satisfy the rules of um, this Washington State Sanitary Commission. And so it has the introduction, um, drawings and specifications, how they're to be prepared. Um, and that's common for almost all community. Every community, even if it's not in a particular hydraulic design manual, has a standards and specifications for how drawings have to be submitted. Because the drawings and specifications are the primary communication tool um, for them to issue a permit, and so they have a, a good idea of what's getting put into the ground. And then our, our last source of information, uh, I have this title, is professional literature. So if during a design uh, process, or practice you come across a portion of uh, the design you're working on that's not addressed in the design manual uh, we can turn to various sources in the professional literature to provide guidance for uh, that particular topic so I have a picture here as an example of gravity sanitary sewer design and construction and um, this is uh, the manual of practice ASCE Manual of Practice number 60 and the Water Environment Federation Manual of Practice FD-5. So different trade organizations often collaborate on these to produce a, a single manual because writing one of these things is an ordeal. Uh, this particular manual of practice, I don't happen to have a personal copy, but bound it's a couple inches thick. It's got a lot of information in it. And Generally, what a manual practice, you can think of it as it's a, it's a summary of the current state of practice of that topic. So it might have the equivalent of that design manual for a particular community, and they maybe look at 10 or 20 communities and, for lack of a better word, come up with some sort of average practice for the particular topic. Uh, another source of information is the vendor literature. So this is from the American Concrete Pipe Institute. This has a nice diagram on how to do trenching for uh, different soil types for their particular products. So if uh, one was to come across an unusual situation or be doing design in a community that doesn't have a specific trenching specification, so for example, that City of Houston Infrastructure Design Manual that's on the server, uh, they have a whole chapter on uh, trenching and soil stabilization for when you uh, lay pipes. Um, the vendor literature is certainly um, useful. 
Um, yes, it's a vendor. They're trying to sell a product, but it's in their best interest to provide the best information that they can get their hands on, even if it's going to be used to place a competitor's product. And then the last source of information would be um, what I have titled as the academic literature. Um, and the reason uh, manual of practice or vendor literature is preferred over academic literature is simply because the perception that the technologies in the manual of practice or the vendor are proven technologies. And by proven, I mean that in the litigation sense. And things that come out of the academic literature are often perceived as experimental. Uh, and that's, that's hardly the, the truth, but that's the perception. And so one would appeal to academic literature last most in a uh, professional design context. So now we'll get to uh, part two. Um, let me check the chat because I've been bad about that. Oh, sorry, Mr. Garrett. I didn't see you there. Uh, you're admitted now. Hopefully you're still around. You are a patient person. God bless you. Yeah, the chat window's empty, so let me move on to part two. So part two, uh, continuing, is uh, this is, top, is, is entitled Project Layout. If you were to examine all those manuals that are on the server, and more, if you went and got your own from different places, you would discover that most of the manuals spend a considerable amount of space explaining how drawings are to be submitted for approval. And um, that, uh, to me, implies that the project layout's kind of important. I mean, maybe that's obvious. Uh, the actual layout has some flexibility within the right-of-ways that you have permits to use. And so that's up, to some extent, to the hydraulic engineer. And there's where the creativity comes in, is how to use the right-of-way you have um, to... Um, provide the service to the owner uh, that you want and make a profit and produce a good design. So a designer would typically use some version of the uh, following to design a new water system. Uh, you would set up a system grid on an area plan. So you have an area plan, perhaps area photos, and you make an initial layout of your uh, distribution system. So imagine that loop system or the branch system from an earlier slide um, and you would uh, identify locations that you call nodes and that's where you're going to allocate uh, daily demand. So a node may be a point in the system where you're going to accumulate the demand of the 10 nearest houses to that node. And so it will be whatever a house takes times 10 that's what's demanded at that location. And so that's called doing a skeletized model. Then you would uh, determine the peak factors. We'd estimate the fire requirements. And then we would project demand into the future, either population growth model as well as physical build out. A node's important because it's used in our hydraulic model, which is an approximation of what we're actually going to build but they tend to be pretty good approximations. It's a junction point in the system where we can attribute or assign a demand. It also happens to correspond for places where we hook pipes together. Um, models use those nodes to calculate the system demands, pressures, water quality, and velocity. And these items, pressure, water quality, velocity, are usually prescribed in the guidance documents with minimum and maximum values. If you recall from RG195, the minimum value for Texas was 35 PSI, so it's clearly prescribed in the document. It's conceivable that one could design a water system without using distribution modeling software. Um, but ultimately, you would be doing some roll-your-own calculations, and if 
it's a network of any considerable size. I mean, I mean, it's well within any one of us to be able to design something to serve 200 connections, branch type system, probably without using a hydraulic model. Do it all in a spreadsheet, it'd be just fine. But as soon as we start rolling things into loops and getting some substantial um, complexity, uh, it would be foolhardy to do it without some sort of modeling um, analysis. Professional quality software is, is, is inexpensive, at least for distribution system modeling. Actually, it's free. So there's no reason to design a system without using a hydraulic model other than just being stubborn. And so the guidance documents implicitly almost demand a model. So that's, that's why we're going to spend a little bit of time in this course on modeling. We're going to use the software EPA Net, the free version that's supplied by the US EPA. Um, there's commercial software uh, that uh, uses, uses the same computation engine, but has a arguably superior interface. And the reason is, is they can integrate um, the hydraulic calculations and other design tools into a single software product. Um, and it saves, it saves time. And time is money. So by all means, a designer should use commercial software where, when it's available. So for this class, we're not going to use commercial software. We'll use the uh, government software. Um, and the, the trade-off is it's not as easy to use and it's not integrated to other design tools. So there's more work on our part. <coughs> but it will give you um, the designing, uh, the use experience that you need. You'd be able to go to any commercial product and figure it out pretty quickly. So um, the designer is going to need some existing data. And Obviously, there'll be a discussion with the owners, but at some point, we're going to have to make actual quantities for the design situation. And to, um, to make these, uh, we'll find that a, uh, uh, a map is a useful tool uh, for a couple reasons. It actually helps us physically lay out the uh, system as well as uh, determine future demands. So the demands need to be compiled and situated on an area map. Um, the example I showed last time with the Eagle Pass when I was demonstrating the EPA Net software. So each of those little colored dots on that um, aerial photo represent a demand node, and and so that's what means that's what it means that needs to be compiled and situated on a map. Now in that particular map, it was fairly complex. Um, we couldn't see the demands, but if we use the mouse and select a node, it's, it's in the model database that was in that uh, program. Once completed, that map helps determine nodal locations and pipe diameters and draw the system schematic. Um, the pipe diameters affect performance. So the uh, uh, generally, uh, the larger diameter of the pipe the less head loss for a given flow rate. That's desirable. And I have a comment here that the trench is usually the largest cost. And so the hydraulics doesn't need to be cheated to falsely save trenching costs. Um, the cost difference between an 8 inch and 12 inch diameter pipe, it's not trivial, but compared to the difference between making a trench to accommodate an 8 inch or a 12 inch pipe, it's pretty small. And so uh, this is one of the few instances where you kind of want to think up when you're doing the designs. Um, the designers need to pick a proper size to meet the peak demands and fire protection while maintaining adequate pressure in the system. So we could do everything with huge diameter pipes, but to keep the pressures up, we're going to have to push a lot of water into those pipes and that's going to cost money, both the money to pay for the raw water and the money for the pumping system to generate the energy to keep the pressure up. Whereas with a smaller diameter pipe, we don't have as much volume overall to deal with, so it, it can cost less to uh, keep the pressures up. 
And in practice, there's a trade-off between the two. And that's, that's what our modeling tools give us, is the ability to evaluate that trade-off. Oftentimes, we want to establish pressure zones. So those are uh, locations in a um, study or design area uh, where the pressure can be maintained between a high value and a low value. And it's especially important when there's changes in grade or when the elevation of one community uh, of the community changes over a short distance. Um, it, otherwise we will get too, too high a pressure on the low elevation parts of the system and not enough pressure on the high elevation part. And so if there's more than an 80 foot grade differential uh, that requires us to modify the design to have controlled pressure zones. Um, and in areas of even larger grade differentials such as uh, mountain communities there might be several consecutive pressure zones. So you can think, think of um, an area on the top of a hill and then you move downhill 80 feet and then downhill another 80 feet. Um, making those two 80 foot jumps we have to put hydraulic structure into the system so that the um, pressure during that 80 foot drop doesn't get so big that it damages everything downstream of it and drain the whole system. We use uh, the concept of hydraulic grade lines to identify uh, these pressure zones. So the hydraulic grade line minimum is the highest elevation plus 2.31 times the maximum working pressure in pounds per square inch. And the maximum is the low elevation, 2.31 times the maximum working pressure. And so we can use these minimum and maximum hydraulic grade lines to help establish where, as we're moving across a community, we're going to have to uh, do a pressure zone change. The location of junctions depends um, as much on the plan layout of the project site uh, than on the hydraulics. So in general, um, the grid distribution node locations themselves have little effect on the overall model because there's customers' demands along the real system between nodes. But the node locations and elevations are certainly important in large transmission mains. And if we're uh, making our first cut at a model, we usually want to put the nodes at the lowest elevation of a loop system where the grades fluctuate significantly. Now with modern modeling software, um, we can kind of uh, put modeling nodes where we want to obtain information. And, and so these rules can be somewhat uh, relaxed. This is more designed for if we're going to do the hydraulic model by hand, meaning programming it in a spreadsheet or, uh, or some kind of Python script. So if we use the um, professional model, we can kind of put nodes where, it, where it's helpful uh, to ask the uh, questions. The next uh, is materials. Pipe materials affect the performance of the system. Uh, distribution systems are built from a variety of materials. The common ones are iron pipe, ABS, PVC, and high density polyethylene. They're all good materials for specific applications and it's, and it's quite feasible to um, have different materials joining each other. Uh, there are fittings that can make that happen and the system will work. Some jurisdictions specify specific material and so the designer should read that ahead of time before you go all to all this trouble to uh, design a system and find out that the particular pipe material you've selected is not acceptable to the um, community or to the customer. I mean, that's not the end of the world if that happens because it's relatively easy in the modeling phase to change materials. Um, and hopefully they have good inspectors and don't let you buy them and put them in the ground until they accept the design. The polymers are all pretty low friction devices. Um, but they have a realistic upper limit to the pressures they can withstand. And as their diameters get big, their ability to resist 
soil pressure um, declines, whereas iron pipe is uh, is quite amenable to large diameter um, use. And in fact, they have um, iron line concrete pipe, which you pretty much can build an airport on top of it and it won't affect it. So again, depending on uh, application and the location of your design will help with the material selection. Okay, so the last part of the presentation, I need to modify the screen sharing. I'll go to full desktop. I don't actually have it turned into a PDF yet, so I'm going to actually run it as PowerPoint. And Actually, we'll solve that PDF problem right now. Did that happen in the background? Hmm. Okay, now it's just a matter of me uploading it.